Northumberland has a surprising number of picturesque little villages dotted along the coastline, and Alnmouth is certainly high on this list to explore. Just like the last coastal village we visited, it hides details of an industrious past, and you just need to know where to look to find the clues. Alnmouth played a key role in feeding the nation 200 years ago, before a natural disaster changed everything. Join us as we explore this fascinating village by the sea. Alnmouth is 35 miles from the nearest city, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, and is perched slightly above the mouth of the River Alne, surrounded by sandy beaches, free from flooding, the perfect spot for a coastal port and village. In the mid-12th century, the Barons of Annick, who lived in the impressive Annick Castle, which we'll visit later in the series, petitioned King John to build a new settlement. He granted a charter with a license for a market and a small port was built on the shoreline. Situated on the border between Scotland and England, it was involved in various wars between the two countries and suffered considerable damage when it burnt down in 1336. The plague swept through the village in 1348, wiping out most of the community, and its fortunes wouldn't improve until the mid-17th century, and the harbour was bustling with large trading vessels. The most notable export from the port was grain, followed by coal and eggs, pork, pickled salmon for the London trade, and wool for the Yorkshire woollen industry. Imports of blue slate from Scotland, timber from Holland and Scandinavia, even guano from Peru, an excellent fertiliser for the crops. The Industrial Revolution and the growing population of the country made places like Alnmouth important to help feed the country. The grain trade gave rise to 16 granaries in the village, some of which still exist hidden in plain sight as residential properties. We are on Northumberland Street, the main thoroughfare of Alnmouth, and one of the earliest granaries can be seen right next to the parish church. The oldest portion fronts onto the street and is now the village store. Further buildings were added, making one long 100-metre store for grain, principally corn for bread and oats to feed the vast number of horses for transport and agricultural work. The cottage windows were added when it was converted into residential properties. Walking up Prospect Place are the four properties that now separate the building. Look closely and you see the weathered steps up to the first floor entrance to the granary where the grain was hauled. Walking down to the former bustling port, the River Alne meets the sea. The tide has turned and is now flooding the estuary and harbour. Prior to the early 1800s, the river followed a different meandering course around Church Hill. In medieval times, this sandstone headland was the site of St Wallerick's Chapel, which has since disappeared due to the Reformation, centuries of conflict with Scotland and erosion. The cross on Church Hill is said to mark the spot where St Cuthbert, the patron saint of Northumbria, agreed to become Bishop of Lindisfarne. This high ridge was linked to the village, but on Christmas Day 1806, a huge storm crashed through the sandbar between the village and Church Hill, changing the course of the river forever. Over time, the original route silted up and became salt marshes, and the port of Alnmouth started to fall into decline. Large ships being built could no longer enter the shallow harbour, making loading and unloading more difficult, and the advent of the railway and a new station in 1847 meant goods could be transported by land. 
The final straw came in 1896 when a merchant ship called Joanna overturned in the port. It was deemed too dangerous for large vessels and this signalled the end of Alnmouth as a sea trading port. The railway did manage to bring a positive change and Victorians flocked here as tourists to enjoy the wonderful beaches and the opening of a nine-hole golf course in 1869. The railway survived until 1968 when services were withdrawn and the branch line closed, but by then visitors were starting to arrive by car. To reach Church Hill with its views of the village and the ruins of the 1869 Mortuary Chapel requires either a barefoot squelch across the river at low tide or a four-mile detour out of the village along the road. The rising tide and the need to check into our Airbnb in Embleton before dark eliminates both options today. The Victorians used a tiny ferry to get across in high tide, enticed by beach huts on the remote sands. The ferry hut shares a delightful pictorial history of fishing in the village and the ferry service which continued until the 1960s when the beach huts were no longer used and demand fell away. It's a tight squeeze inside but do take a moment to enjoy some of the wonderful vintage photographs. Let's take a walk back into the village centre and see some more of the pretty buildings and inside the parish church. Most of the buildings in the village are made from stone, the way it's been done for centuries, but at the top of Garden Terrace is Alm House, a fine example of a brick property built by a successful local corn merchant to show off his wealth during the boom times. You'll notice similar properties dotted around the village of the same grandeur, some of which are now restaurants and bars. Walking back up Northumberland Street and opposite the church is the Red Lion Inn, one of four pubs still open today to quench your thirst. Back in the 18th century, there were at least 10 offering food and drink to thirsty sailors. Those called inns also provided accommodation and the Red Lion Inn and the Sun Inn still do today. St John the Baptist Church was consecrated in 1876, a fine example of Victorian craftsmanship. It was built of sandstone with a Welsh slate roof on land donated by the 4th Duke of Northumberland. 
Some of the stained glass windows are early examples of the work of C. E. Kemp. It's a lovely village church for the community. Northumberland Street offers a delightful mix of independent shops brimming with unique gifts, local crafts and stylish clothing. Foodies will be spoilt for choice with a diverse selection of restaurants and of course the pubs serve everything from classic pub fare to gourmet cuisine. It certainly promises to be a memorable experience for all that wander its charming length. Hindmarsh Hall is another example of where a four-floor granary was in use 250 years ago. As the village lacked a church in 1859, the fourth Duke of Northumberland converted it into a church until the St John's was built and opened in 1876. Today it's a community centre and hall for hire. We have reached the end of the main thoroughfare and we get one last chance to look at the estuary and out to sea. It's time for us to head to our Airbnb. If you were not watching last week, this video was made on the first day of our trip to Northumberland and we had already visited some wonderful coastal locations at the start of this travel series. We scaled St Mary's Lighthouse for panoramic views delved into the history of another sea trading village, Seaton Sluice, once a powerhouse of coal and bottle exports. We popped our head in on the market town of Morpeth and ticked off a number of its historical attractions. Next time we'll settle into our pretty cottage in the village of Embleton and share some of the wonderful locations in and around the area, including the quaint fishing village of Craster where the smell of kippers being smoked fills the air. Join us again for Walks and History as we continue our Northumberland travel series. Make sure you are subscribed and following us on social media for lots more photos and information about Northumberland. See you again next time.